Thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you for watching the podcast. If you do so on YouTube or wherever you watch it, please hit that button to subscribe and see my comedies and other things of that nature. That makes me happy. Thank you for being patient about the podcast. Sorry that I wasn't here last week for Halloween and that this episode is a day late, but that's what happens sometimes in life. Changes get thrown your way. Things pop up in your life and you just got to roll with the punches or roll with the punches, which is a show I would have had on NBC if this was 1996. So, uh, what a world that would have been. <laughs> you know the drill. Come see me do comedy. This Saturday, I'll be in St. Louis, Missouri at the Flyover Comedy Festival. Uh, I will be in Chicago, Illinois the next weekend, Friday and Saturday, excuse me, Thursday and Friday only for at the Rosemont Zany. So please go see me there. That's the last two shows of the year. So that's the last two places you can see me for 2022. Um, other than that, you can still see me on in your screen in your house or on your uh, phones wherever you like you can go watch loot Apple TV Plus with me Maya Rudolph other wonderful amazing people you could watch uh, Harley Quinn on HBO Max that would be great you could watch Jellystone on HBO Max that's fun um, is there anything else that I'm in I always forget oh the great north that I'm in on Fox check that out and then other than that go watch Blair Saki's in the Aqua Teen movie we love her so go check that out that seems like a good idea and see anything else um i'll get to the shout outs in the in the very intro proper uh so mm, 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 twitch twitch.tv ron underscore funches if you want to hang out watch me play video games or play games with me about to get to that god of war ragnarok and whatnot so come on by if you want to do that um and then happy holidays i love you let's get to the show hi Thank you for making it through. Appreciate you being here. Love you. Those people who support us on things like Patreon, I appreciate that. You can go patreon.com slash getting better with Ron. I think that's it. If not, just Google it, figure it out. And <laughs> you can be a Patreon supporter just like Jalen and Leland. Two wonderful people who are out there doing their best, trying their hardest. Sometimes people try to put obstacles in their way, but guess what? They're problem solvers and they overcome and they destroy those obstacles and then look back and laugh and remember those as the good times. Because <laughs> that's how life works. I hope you're feeling strong. I hope you're feeling brave. I hope you're feeling loved. And you're grateful for that love in whatever form it takes. I think so often we get caught up in wanting love or wanting our life to be the way that we envision it, the way that we want it, or the way that like our culture wants it to be, right? I talked to so many people who are, you know, getting older as I approach 40 myself. We're like, oh, I want a kid. I want a family. I want that picket fence. And... Sometimes that's not what ha makes happiness and that's not what makes you feel life should be custom fitted. And if what that doesn't make you feel good or if that's not in your life's plans for you, you shouldn't hold yourself to those standards or make yourself feel bad because you don't have those things. Because you probably have things in your life that those people wish they had probably like sleep, um, uh, you know, uh, expendable income, things of that nature. You know, that if those people with families don't have uh, the ability to watch whatever the fuck they want, whenever they want. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of good things on both sides of the fence and family and life and, and love takes so many forms. And I think one of the best things you can do in your life with any relationship is just try to make sure you keep that love no matter what form you have, you know, I think in a lot of ways it's, uh, you can look at it a lot with parenting, you know, the relationship that you have with your mom and your dad might be good. It might be bad, but it changes as you uh, become an adult and have your own self power and, and, and become self-reliant. And, and hopefully if you got a good relationship, you that, that 
relationship that used to be them looking over you becomes more of this friendship and this mentorship that they still provide you with about being an adult and how to handle things as you get older and handle life mistakes and making things that seem like such a big deal to you because you never been through them before um you know let's showing them that they're commonplace showing them that they're part of your everyday life whatever loss it is whether it's you lose a loved one um you know like i lost my grandma recently and that's been a struggle or uh you're just whatever it is it's just hard to sometimes go through life and if you have someone there that has been through the same the same struggles you've been through it makes it just a little bit easier and easier to deal with also while we're just here i guess i should just remind you to vote get your vote on get that vote going on because you know people be trying to trick us and give things in our best interest and then the fact that we you know we need to make sure that they go hey you can still get abortions here you know Cause it's 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 a scary world out there, and I think you gotta you gotta protect what we thought um, was just given rights that we just have. But things are we make so much progress, and I know I keep speaking in half sentences, but it's just because I got a lot of different emotions going on in me right now. Because there's so much going on in the world, I've been overwhelmed by things, been sick, uh, been having uh, uh, issues just at home, and been having issues uh, at work a little bit, and just trying to get myself t- together and ready for 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 the next season of my show and stuff. And so, um. Just got a lot of different emotions and stuff going on, and you, I just feel like you, you gotta sometimes remind yourself and remind people of where you stand, especially as uh, it appears that more and more people keep finding out about me and, and, and learning about me, which I think is a beautiful thing and wonderful thing. But then I find I see online, which is always a horrible place, where people will say some stuff about you and then other people start going, oh, I didn't know that about that person. And then they everybody starts taking it as fact. Uh, so it's just a good time since we are getting ready to vote and stuff. And I will never tell you how to vote, but I'm going to tell you what I believe in and what's important to me. And uh, I hope that it matches up with you. If not, it's okay to disagree as long as we're sweet and civil to each other and as long as you're not racist or homophobic or sexist or don't believe in conspiracy theories. If you remember that joke, that's fun. Speaking of which, I posted that joke. That kind of leads back into everything. One of people's jokes that people like about me, my conspiracy theory joke, and I always think it's fun because in when I wrote it, um, not that I, I never like to explain a joke because I don't think you should explain art, but it was just a joke about different conspiracies i even go through the actual conspiracies that i'm talking about in the bit if you watch the full bit but since it came out years ago any type of like you know whether it's a super leftist conspiracy or super right-wing conspiracy sometimes those type of people post a bit to go like "Ooh, look this is this is what smart people think that the government is lying to you and they cut out me talking about how you shouldn't be homophobic and racist which is always interesting uh (laughs) But <laughs> I saw a comment recently where somebody posted the joke again and it gets a bunch of likes or whatever and or not or whatever. I love it when it gets posted and it goes viral or whatever and it makes me be like, oh, look at me writing jokes that people really fuck with or get mad about. And I like that. Um and then someone was like, This is a horrible joke and you spreading misinformation about vaccines. And I was like, I wrote that joke before the pandemic was even a twinkle in in i was about to say a joke that would not allow me to be played in certain places so i didn't say it oh, <laughs> before it was even created or co-opted or put around i wrote that joke and um and then they were people were like you gotta calm down I was like well Ron's a you don't know Ron's a closet anti-vaxxer. He talked about how vaccines made his son have autism and stuff like that. And I have gone on podcasts and talked about that the first time that I noticed traits of my son having autism was after uh, a, rec- a re- regular 
shot for his for different you know the the, you're the different va- vaccinations the exact same thing but it wasn't for for covid different vaccinations um and i just always said that as an antidotal thing that was a part of my life but um apparently now that meant that i was a closet anti-vaxxer and all that, that you know and i'm like i got three fucking boosters in my i'm fully moderna all the way through i don't even mix and match i'm a pure blood what comes to- <laughs> Got more four doses of Moderna through me, baby. Don't fucking fuck with me. And uh, so I was just like, you know what? I always hate that. I always feel like you could you could listen to me. You could talk to me. You can feel my energy. You just assume what I'm about. But, you know, we live in weird times. So just in case anybody ever tries to tell you something about me, um, you could or and you know me or if, if, if someone brings something up. Let's just refer them back to this thing where I just look you directly in the eye and tell you what I love and what I'm about. I am a big believer in positive energy, optimism. I'm a big believer that your mind can, is a very powerful tool that can create the reality that you live in. And that you believe that your life is shitty, it will be so. And if you believe your life is beautiful, the universe will meet you halfway to make it so. I'm not saying that you don't have to put in work to do so, but I'm just saying that I believe that you you, the life is what you make it. Um, I'm a big believer in women's rights in whatever form it may be. If you want to get abortions, get as many as you want. They should be free to me. I think we should be doing it like in Japan where women get a bus in the first in the morning and last at night and should be spending safe. That uh, the natural way of the world is a uh, feminine led where men are the the muscle, the the and. Uh, and of course, people might turn that against me right away, but I'm just going to talk how I talk. The men are there to support and be strength and to provide and provide peace of mind for their women, not to dominate, not to um, attack, not to be pillagers or rapers of, but to provide safety. And when you provide safety and positive energy and, and kindness for women, then they tend to just open up naturally to you, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big believer, of course, in just rights of all people, black people, Jewish people, because it feels like right now, if you black, sometimes people think that you might hate Jewish people because of Kanye, Kyrie Irving. And a lot of people don't know about this or will say stuff about this. But I'm going to tell you just a little bit. I know about this. It's just a small sect of, of black people who are, you know, black Israelites who consider the black people to be the actual Jews. And they think and that's when like Kyrie, he probably won't ever say this allegedly to me with Kyrie because I don't want to get sued when Kyrie says if like like I can't be anti-Semitic because I know who I am it's that uh, dog whistle of people talking about being a black Israelite that the black people are the true Jews the true Hebrews and that these the Jewish people that we know are falsified and you know in the evil and stuff and I don't believe in any of that shit I think I'm a big believer in the black Jewish coalition uh, both in music uh, with people like the Beastie Boys and <laughs> And that guy Dave uh, from the show Dave and uh, in comedy as well. Uh, you know, it's just a strong black Jewish coalition. There always has been shows like shows like Seinfeld. It's just a like a Zen diagram, and it should be of people. But there's this thing lately of people comparing their plights instead of letting bonding over shared trauma, and that's how I always known it to be. It's also again, but usually big fan of Jewish women, very lovely, wonderful, and open to look things. And <laughs> <laughs> and so I stand with the Jewish community, with the black community. Uh, with women, with, with 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 oppressed groups, usually anytime if you if if you oppress Palestine, Ukraine, you know if you I, with the rebels, I'm with the rebels. I'm not with the empire, and that's just who I am as a person. Um, and I tend to just rock that way. Oh, also oh, pro trans, fuck the turfs. Um, and. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, pro sex worker, pro weed, pro all that shit. I just love, I just believe in a fucking positive world of being yourself and taking care of your energy and taking care of your life and custom fit in your life and not being held to one standard of just being like, uh, I need to have two kids, a uh, wife and a uh, picket fence. And that's what makes a life in a 401k. And that's what makes a life good. What makes life good to me is good people around you, good friendships, good energy, getting able to travel, being able to learn and just being able to be yourself. To have the space, to have the people around you that accept you for you, who don't make you change who you are, who don't force you into a box, who don't make you put on airs, who don't, who aren't embarrassed of you, who aren't, um, who see your value. And that's what life's all about to me, surrounding the people who see value, you run towards those people. And that's what I try to do with my comedy, with my life, with anything I do. I don't try to change up, for, you know, best or worst. I fuck with who I fuck with. I love my life and I'm going to go as far as I do in my career off of me. And I kind of like that. I'm never going to be like, oh, he made it because he was somebody's boy or because he's networking with this person. People either fuck with me because they know my reputation and they know what I'm about and they know I love to bring positive energy and 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 um, I'm I, I'm open to notes but I come with an idea. Uh, that's who I am. And for let's get ready for this next year. It's a good time to start thinking about vision boards, thinking about goals, thinking about what we did accomplish this year, what we could have done better at. Um, and as we march, and for me personally, again. Marching closer and closer to that 40th birthday, and I'm using it as a marker for me. So I remember when I was married, my first marriage, when um, I was like 20 years old, and I remember going to my father-in-law's birthday party, and he's turning like 40, I think he's turning 42. I was 21, so I was like, this man is twice as old as me. And I just remember he had that picket fence. He had the little water feature in his front yard. And I knew also that his wife was not treating him well. He knew also that he wasn't happy that he was tra- that his, his kids weren't doing well and call, do calling. I can say it because she she knows that she a fan of me now, but even though she hated me back then because she was on methamphetamines and stuff. I won't say your name. <laughs> you calling him bomb threats and doing all a bunch of shit like that. And my man had to live with that, that his kid was off the rails doing drugs, calling him bomb threats to school, but he wanted to portray that life of having everything of having that that picket fence having the two kids and stuff and then he eventually freaked out and he had to leave and, and find his happiness elsewhere and i remember i like man i don't want to be that age in that position and I'm lucky that I don't feel that way. I love my life. I love the people that are around me. I love what I'm doing. And I'm trying to be in the best health, best shape, best mental uh, space, and just loving what I do. Loving the, I'm loving the shows that I'm on. I can watch a show that I'm in now and be like, God damn, I'd watch this even if I wasn't in it. I like this shit. I'm excited about where life could go. And I'm up to any challenge. I'm excited to pay the cost, to be the boss. Hopefully make my own production company. Who knows? We're kind of rambling now. A little bit stone. But also you can see I've been really focusing on the health. If you're watching the video version, you can watch the ebbs and flows. And right now I'm glowing and my face is looking nice and chiseled with different definitions. And we're going to keep it going. So stay with me through the holidays. It's going to be difficult. We got Thanksgiving. We got Christmas. We got parties. We got drama. We got family. We got gloom and doom and rain and snow. It's going to be rough this time. But we gonna stick through it together right and we're gonna make it through together because there's always another day than this next year and there's always time right now to start today and have a better life if you want to get your vision board mind together where you know we're gonna do a vision board party online so go get your crayons go get your construction paper go get your magazines go get your pictures of your sports cars your house that you want of the uh, life that you want to live of the tranquility that you want to bring into your life and let's focus 
focus and go get that shit because it's on us. Nobody else gonna bring it to us because they out there focusing on they shit. Fuck it. I mean, that's half the shit right now with this vote and stuff, right? Vote for the people who got your best interests at heart. But also remember, nobody gonna take care of you out here. So get out there and fucking get it how you want it. Live your life how you want to live it. Appreciate you guys. Enjoy this episode. I don't even know if we decided who the guest was going to be on this best of episode. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> we really flying by the seat of our pants. Uh, let me just pick a name and then we'll do that one. <laughs> Let's go with let's go with a classic episode who I just love so I can promote the show, which I also love. The Righteous Gemstones. You gotta love it. You gotta watch it. Check it out. And this is one of my favorite people in the world. Favorite actress performing and just a cool person. Edie Patterson. Enjoy it. Hi, Edie. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's a pleasure. Please. <laughs> Love it. Big fan of your work. Thanks, dude. Um, that's why I wanted to have you here. This is usually how we start uh, with an intro, especially if I don't know the person. Because mm-hmm. normally on my podcast, I know everybody who I interview because I yeah. don't like many people. I don't want to <laughs> interview people who I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but... Um, I think like I just saw you well no I was a fan of your work I saw you on Vice Principals and mm-hmm. I was like this is amazing work as such like detailed character work as far oh, as man. taking someone not just being hilarious and funny but making this real character of this desperate woman who is desperate for male attention to the mm-hmm. point of where she's uh, taking someone who yourself or uh, an attractive lady hope you don't mind me saying it, oh, but then, I don't mind <laughs> <laughs> and, and then making it through the desperation someone who you would never even want to be with and to me that's such <laughs> good. good acting <laughs> and i was like who is this person and then i just seen just pop up on so many things and everybody loves the righteous gemstones like including my girlfriend and i and it's rare for us to find a show that we watch together <laughs> so we appreciate you um and then i saw you on instagram and then i just was like she seems like a very nice person <laughs> and then you follow me and you start liking my stuff and i'm like cool now we're friends mm-hmm. and that's where we've been and so then in return the question is why are you here why did you say yes <laughs> Because I had the same thing um, via Instagram. I had listened to your podcast some. And then when I noticed you would like some of my stuff, I really felt like that's that dude who I'm friends with through his podcast. Now he likes my stuff online. And then maybe uh, maybe Rachel Rush like reposted something of yours or, mm-hmm. or something. And um, then I realized like, oh, maybe he has my same agent. I don't even know if you're with her or mm-hmm. not. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I just liked you virtually. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me real happy. Mm-hmm. Let's get to know each other a little Let's bit. Let's do it. Let's so get into it. I know you're from, because I don't like to do all recap, and I know you got to do that a lot when you're doing interviews, but you're from a place called Texas City, yep. which is not it's a real place. I know. It, it sounds like made, a TV place. Yeah. It seems <laughs> like a cartoon that probably where Speedy Gonzalez lives. <laughs> 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 why speedy gonzalez well because i feel like he was an american cartoon but he would live close to the border but they wouldn't have put him in mexico because they would have felt that was bad for their optics <laughs> if you really want to so let's know put why, him in texas city yeah i like it <laughs> that's why i put him there <laughs> Oh, man, I would have really liked for Speedy Gonzalez to be where I was from. I was very into Speedy Gonzalez reruns. Were you? Yeah. Oh, man. I really liked fast things, like fast and strong cartoons. I was also very into Popeye reruns. Oh, I love Popeye. Yeah. To the point that I tried spinach at one point as a very little kid, like three or four. And I really thought like it'd make my muscles bulge out. And then I I discovered it was really gross because it was like, canned spinach like he eats yeah yeah and i was like oof all the nutrients are gone Mm -mm. by then yeah that's same thing like me with hulk hogan he's like take it take your vitamins take your prayers he was leaving out all the steroids right he didn't tell me that (laughs) right he left that out (laughs) like if you told me i would take in the steroids (laughs) (laughs) yeah just lay it out hulk yeah (laughs) just telling the truth trying to get there (laughs) 
But what started your love of comedy? How did you get into improvising and, and where you are? Let's take it back a few steps. Yeah, let's take what it back. What started your love of it? Um, I always liked funny stuff from when I was really little, but I was super shy. And um, so kind of only liked being funny with my family and their friends. And uh, my dad it kind of has a weird absurd kind of dark sense of humor and my mom has um <laughs> also an absurd sense of humor but it's very um like elementary school teacher humor to the point that it like falls off the cliff mm -hmm. into absurdity um like anytime we tell my mom to tell a joke here's a quick side note what is this joke it, it starts with something and she's like um Knock, knock. And you say, who's there? She'll say spatula. And then you're like, spatula who? And she goes, spatula. Ha, 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 ha. Like, that's the joke. And you're so mad because you're like, that's so dumb. <laughs> but, you're, <laughs> but you're dying laughing. You're like, damn it. Jeannie got me again. <laughs> but they both have weird senses of humor. And so I always liked making them laugh. And I liked doing like, my first grade teacher, weirdly, in Texas City was an English um, Christian scientist, this older woman, Miss, Mrs. Stelly. And I would come home and do Mrs. Stelly's um, accent for them. And I just noticed really young, they thought that was so funny. And so I, I just always liked that stuff. I loved Carol Burnett reruns. Mm. I um, was obsessed with Pee Wee Herman. And kind of knew he, that he was something different, but I didn't know until way later, maybe until I started even doing stuff with the Groundlings that I go like, oh, wow, I get what he was doing. It's so, it's so specific, but it's so blown out at the same time. He made this cartoon a real guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's what I was responding to as a tiny kid. Uh, but yeah, I always liked that mix of like super specific character stuff. And I liked pretending to be people that I saw and coming home and doing their voice and staring at people and then trying to do them. And yeah. So you were able to mimic people at an early age. Yeah. Or I liked making up a character off of the way someone looked or, mm -hmm. you know, and then forcing my, <laughs> my parents to answer me and. I'd be, you know, I'd pretend I was some bad kid or something. And, I'd and they make were always them. supportive of that. Yeah, they were always into it. Thank God. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. A, yeah. It's usually, I, I would say that's that's not typically mm. what, how you hear it would go down. Like in Texas with a plumber dad and an elementary school teacher mom. Like, yeah, but they were always, um, they were always kind of had the mindset of, yeah, go for it. We don't have any money to help you like do it, <laughs> but go for but it, make it happen. It yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which yeah, I think all you need is like somebody believing in you. Truly, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think so. What we all have at a young age, everybody feels like that's the fun part about being young is that you feel like you can do anything. Totally, that was something that my mom instilled in my sister and I very early, and mm -hmm. always checked me. Um, I, she tells this story all the time because my sister is a doctor. She tells the story about when I was like eight and my sister was six We went out to dinner together. And I was like, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do when you grow up? And then my sister was like, I want to be a doctor. And I go, girls have to be nurses. You can't be a doctor. And then my mom goes, no, you could be whatever you want to be. You, mm -hmm. you say whatever you want to be, you can be. What do you want to be? And my sister just goes, mm, a cow. <laughs> 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 yes <laughs> did you know what you wanted to be that little i did yeah it, yeah it was kind of like a um just a roundabout way of getting to it if yeah. you asked me when i was five or six i would have told you directly when i was brave i'm like yes i want to be a comedian i'm yeah. gonna be the best comedian ever uh -huh. and then it took a you know become a teenager and things and being like i don't think this is a real job and mm -hmm. how do you just do this you mm -hmm. know people people are chosen i assume totally and it's so confusing especially if you're from a family that has no connection to any of it i think it takes a while for your brain to go oh that could be my job because even if you want to do it and you feel like you're supposed to do it 
yeah, you don't understand how it happens even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weird. There's this weird like cognitive dissonance for a long time until you finally do have like some experience on stage or something where you go like, oh, right. Yeah, I still don't know exactly how you do this, but I know I'm going to. Yeah, and so you find something where you fall into mm -hmm. it. And for me, yeah, I was working at a bank call center and they had me to come up with like a funny video on how to deal with stress because mm -hmm. everybody was calling in and yelling at you about their accounts being overdrawn. Yeah. And so I, for two weeks, they let me not make phone calls and just awesome. make this funny video. Awesome. And then they played it for my team and my team liked it. And then they decided that they were going to play it at the company wide assembly mm -hmm. and then seeing everyone laugh mm -hmm. at these jokes gave me such a rush and then it clicked in my head of going like oh i'm making jokes about banking mm -hmm. what if i make jokes about things i cared about oh, that's awesome dude and then they were like time to get back on the phones and i was like i don't think i'm gonna be working here much longer i'm changed <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah i just stopped going to work yeah. started going to open mics <laughs> yeah it's that that moment is revelatory i think like in probably seventh grade we had this weird talent show where me and some other girls wrote this um this dating game parody and we like each played guys in it and i was the nerd and one was the jock and but yeah we all wrote our own lines and like to be on a stage and say the lines that I wrote and hear them laugh, like something clicked in my brain. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, right. This is, this is a thing. <laughs> yeah. It feels good. Oh, man. Yeah, it just feels like the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember this, the power of the, um, it was years later. It was after I was already working here. I moved to LA and I got my first writing job on, on the Kroll show. Mm -hmm. And I just remember writing this sketch, about the lawyer sketch. And I was just like, bunch of lawyers carrying briefcases. And I just, <laughs> you know, throw away just writing. And then uh -huh. I show up on set and I see the lawyers and I see the briefcases. Yeah. And I go, that just came from my head. Seriously. And that was like, this is fun. Yeah. But then I also was like, I like credit. So I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to be on screen. <laughs> yeah. And man, the, when it's both is the craziest brain explosion. Because mm. I write for Righteous mm -hmm. Gemstones as well. And like, yeah, for something I like thought of in a fever dream of like, Oh, I'll, you know, I'll say this. And then I'll, the eyes rolled back in my head in a dark hotel room or whatever. Like, and then this will happen and then this will happen. And and then, yeah, there's a hundred crew guys with cameras and you're in some weird location. You're like, oh, my God, this is real. Like this came out of this weird dream part of my brain. Like and now we're here doing it. But yeah, I like doing it, too. I like the credit, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like both. I like when people are not afraid to admit it. Although some people just don't like being on screen. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I love both. Mm -hmm. I like. Me, too. But um, I lean into acting after because I had a writing job and I was also was acting on a kid's show at the same uh -huh. time. They were both like my first writing, my first acting job. Oh, wow. And. I was like trying to figure out, well, what do I want to focus on? Yeah. What I was going to be. And then in the kids show, they brought out this beautiful floral cake from one of the kid actresses. And I was like, that's the most beautiful cake I've ever seen. <laughs> I go, I want cake like that. And then one of the writers on that show turns around and was like, well, you could get one. You're an actor. They'll give you one. <laughs> and I was like, acting. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's when it like edged out writing <laughs> yeah. with the cake. <laughs> yeah, it just, I mean, I like, I'm not good at writing in groups that much. I'm not mm -hmm. good at writing for other people. My voice is very specific. Mm -hmm. So, like, even when I was writing on Crow Shows, the things that I worked the best for me were when I was just writing a sketch for myself. Yep. When I go had to go write in his voice, m my brain kind of glazes over. Yeah, it's weirder. It is weird. How do you do it? How do you well, do for both? You know, I would say, like, my first super duper experience with writing was writing stuff for myself at Groundlings. But sometimes you write a sketch with someone. And so that was probably my first foray into, you want to make the whole thing funny. You know, mm -hmm. how how boring would it be in your, if you write a sketch with someone and you're like making sure you say all the funny stuff. Like, <laughs> Some people are like that. I know, I know. 
But it's like, I don't know. I'm a big fan of high tide raises all boats. So if I can, that's where I started learning like, oh, if I can write something super funny for them, it just helps us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I guess, I guess I, if I can tap into the part of my brain that likes uh, pretending to be someone else, then I write better as mm-hmm. them. If I can sort of like almost see their face on my face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As I'm writing for them. Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're writing from a place of truth. You're not making yeah. something up. Yeah. Yeah. It is hard, though, because sometimes your brain just wants to write, like, the thing that you think is funny. And then you have to second guess it and go, but is this what they would say? <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's smart. Yeah. Right. That's fine. I know. I'm just thinking right now, going, oh, my girlfriend's going to love this part of the interview. Oh, yeah? Because she's a writer. She, she, loves oh, that. Cool. she loves that type of stuff. So- <laughs> <laughs> so, I tr- so I just started commenting on it. Like, ooh, she gonna like this later. <laughs> she won't be creeped out at all that I said wear someone else's face. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about how you made the leap from being interested in, in comedy and improvising into um coming to LA and doing things like that. What what made you make that jump how did you get into it um i would say the big sort of bridge and game changer for me i mean i knew i wanted to be an actor but i would say the yeah the biggest uh sort of morphing catalyst for me was starting to improvise and starting to do live shows and um i feel like improv absolutely changed my life made my mindset better, helped me with, you know, just basic shyness and um, bravery and trusting, you know, trusting the moment and knowing Mm. like whatever's happening right now is what's supposed to be happening. And so you took so many life lessons, huge, huge life lessons. I think the whole, I think improv in general is a life philosophy if you let it be. Yeah. Um, I feel the same about acting and stand up. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would say that was the big um, sort of in between was starting to improvise and and then starting to improvise a lot, um, multiple shows a week. And um, yeah, just putting in hours and doing it over and over and over until, you know, when I first started, I feel like I was I feel like I had a um, some amount of natural aptitude for it. But I was like crazy like in my body like the Mm -hmm. the energy of it was like almost uncontrollable in Mm -hmm. me and I was like kind of spazzy and like I still think I did a good job but I was like yeah almost out of body yeah Yeah. all angles and like (laughs) like an animal and um I think yeah just doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it you realize like oh right I don't need to try I need to allow rather than try. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. That, to me, that's everything. It is everything. And to me, that's one of my favorite, what I feel a lot about knowledge in general. And trust. And you're going to have to go with me on this, but I feel like Let's you do it. will. Let's do it. Oh, I get down with all the stuff. I feel like you do. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, but it, to me, like I always found like m- most of my knowledge is like, it's just inner knowledge that I already have that I'm uncovering through uh-huh. experience. It's like, you know, you're like sharpening your sword or sharpening mm-hmm. away the rust of the thing. It's like, you're just, it's not like you're learning new things, which you are, you are learning new things, but what you really are is uncovering your true self. Mm-hmm. And, and that power and being out of control comes from not being used to your true self. Yeah, And so that's what I feel a lot of times when I, like, like, a lot of my acting gigs where I, I know where I'm doing well when I feel that control. When I'm improvising a little bit, I'm having fun, but I don't leave. I yeah. don't leave my body. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. A lot of times I'm like out of control. And it's felt the same way with stand up where it came from when I was first, first six, seven years of stand up. It was like we were doing a roller coaster, but I was hopping in the roller coaster with them. And now mm-hmm. I'm like, I just run the machine. That's awesome. You know? And yeah. It, it's just, um, 
I think again, yeah, just uncovering who you truly are and then being learning to be comfortable and confident with that and not trying, not that's what we do in my acting classes. Whenever I'm fucking up, it's usually she just goes, You're acting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. I am acting. Yeah. I'm not talking to you right now. I'm yeah. not telling you, I'm not being truthful. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's um that's so astute what you just said and so profound of oh. I think all we have, any of us, is that I'm me and you're you and you're specifically you. And there's some Neil Gaiman quote. Do you know that quote about mm. like that that's all we've got? And I'm going to bastardize it, but it's basically like that's your superpower and you're wasting your time if you're trying to be anything other than that. Mm -hmm. And I so, so strongly believe that. And it took me a long time to like feel the truth of that mm -hmm. and go, Oh, right. Dig down into that. Yeah. Don't reach out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not what we're taught to do. A lot of times we're just taught to, to confirm to conform to the people mm -hmm. around us and be like them because they would prefer us not to find our mm -hmm. true powers because yeah. then there's a happiness and you don't necessarily have to purchase that happiness. Mm -hmm. I, totally. knew, I knew you'd be with me. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Cause I mean, think about like, I don't know if I think about performers that have, super lit me up that I, you watch it. I, always, it's a thing for me of like, what are they doing? And it's just, they're so doing their thing. If you think about like Nicholson or Richard Pryor or even like um, Juliette Lewis or like the people that you're like, what's going on? <laughs> that I, that's my favorite is when they're just they're just in their truth. Yeah. And it's exciting and it's raw and weird and yeah. That's what I love about most good good performer but most good art is just like you set me up into this world and you invite me into your world. It's already formed. It's already been there. You're there whether I come by or not. Mm -hmm. But I just happen to come by and I want to get a, <laughs> that's awesome. a view in your world. You mm -hmm. know, that's what I love with any art. And I think that's what people really re are responding to, like with the Righteous Gemstones, is that yeah. it's such I, a specific. I hope so, yeah. It, it, I will tell you because yeah. I, I know you're not allowed to say it because you're making it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I will tell you, I I think that is what people yeah. are responding to and is what I love in art. And it really um, inspires me and helps me because a lot of times I mostly I just write personal mm -hmm. and I write things that about the people who I've seen in my life. And then sometimes you get I get a lot of feedback like of like, oh, it's too dark or people don't want to see this. Or why don't you write something silly or because people like how silly you are. But then I see these little things like, no, if I just get better, if I just keep getting better mm -hmm. at it, this does work. And this is the art I like watching. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That thing you were saying a minute ago is so interesting, too, about the like just uncovering and like wiping off the rust and because that all plays into two, like, I don't know, the time's not linear and like you already know all the stuff, you know, and just like, yeah, just keep wiping that stuff off and finding them what's true because it's already there. Absolutely. I'm down with all that. Good. <laughs> Where does that come from with you? Because I assume Texas City doesn't seem like it would be open to a lot of fun, weird spirituality, <laughs> metaphysical type things that you seem like you are too from your necklace. <laughs> Shout out to Cassidy Freeman who's on my show who gave me this necklace. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, my dad was always uh, into like supernatural stuff via movies mostly. And I think that a huge part of like my open-mindedness about that stuff weirdly comes from like 80s and 90s movies that like stuck in my craw as a kid. And I don't know. I don't know if you ever had this thing where you – would watch a movie and go, oh, I understand this more than I do my actual life. Mm -hmm. Or I, oh, that's how I want to be. And not, that's not in my normal life, but that's how I want to be. 
Yeah, I don't know if you ever felt that thing, but well, for me, it was watching I Love Lucy mm-hmm. all the time. I grew up in South Side Chicago, and it's kind of dangerous, and mm-hmm. uh, and people shooting and stuff. And mm-hmm. then I watch I Love Lucy, and I see this little 1950s life, and they're having fun like that. And I go like, that's what I like. Yeah, <laughs> that's what yeah. I'm interested in. That's awesome. Yeah, because that's that's your that's your soul. Your soul recognized its friends. You know? <laughs> But yeah, I th- probably I'm into that stuff kind of through my dad because um, he always seemed open to sort of the supernatural in real life. And Texas City is an odd place in that it's um, it's full of refineries. And so there's kind of constantly this uh, like a like a sound all the time, especially in the dead of night. Like I'd be laying in my bedroom and would hear like, the chemicals burning off from far away. And it's the kind of place where when you drive in in the dark, it's one of those landscapes that looks like Star Wars from far away because there's so many lit up machines. And um, so I don't know. I think I was in a place where uh, you would you would think if you were uh, wired this way, you would think a lot about what's beyond here. Mm-hmm. What are things felt weirdly um, possible and sometimes um, strange there in, a, in an interesting way. <laughs> yeah. I like that. It's cause sometimes so many people look at uh, growing up in places like that or small towns in general as like this detriment of like, oh, I'm not in L.A. I'm not in New York. I'm not in Boston. Mm-hmm. I'm not in this major town. So I can't do anything. But I think sometimes there's something to the boredom that can yep. be created to the like thinking of what else is there past this that is that if you have an open mind if you're naturally leans that way that it can be very helpful for totally especially if you are having that you know that boredom and that wondering and that curiosity and feeling from a very young age that you're different than that or just like yeah maybe slightly out of place for whatever reason, even if you can't articulate it yet. Yeah. That combo I think can be real helpful, (laughs) a real helpful engine (laughs) for creativity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to feel like you got to keep moving either way. That's how Mm -hmm. I always felt. I was like, Mm -hmm. these aren't my, I have not met my people yet. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, my first try started stand up and I was like, maybe this is it. And I was Mm -hmm. like, wait, no, it's not everybody here either. Mm -hmm. And so then it just became like, oh, I think I just like kind people who are open minded and who are is like my life is kind of like vaudeville in that way where I just hang out with a lot of different um, we all have different jobs. Some of us mm-hmm. are comedians, actors. One of my best friends, a pro wrestler. Mm-hmm. It's just like a bunch of weirdos. But yeah. I think that's all. That's what I draw towards me because yeah. that's what I am. Yeah, totally. Yeah, two of my best friends are one's a novelist and one's a an artist, a sculptor, and um, yeah, they've been my two of my best friends forever. And I I like having that different stuff in my life. And yeah, it comes down to they're rad, sweet people. Yeah. <laughs> Who happen to be creative in their own way. Um, uh, highly creative. When I say in their own way, I just mean they're not actors. They're both off the charts creative. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's what I seek out too, is I seek out sweet. And I like funny people too, yeah. as I'm sure you do. I do. Yeah. But it was a change in, before I was like, oh, if anyone's a com- comedian like me, then we're, we're, we're meant to be friends. Right. Both the thing. And it was a, a shock to the system. Like, no, there's mean comedians. Mm-hmm. There's mean everything. Mm-hmm. So I just had to find the people who are trying to be a positive. Yeah. You know? And sometimes people think that because, you know, because other people were like, oh, that's weird. And that's sappy. And way to, but like. It's a real good thing to do and a good thing to be. And obviously, as we look around, a needed thing. Yep. And so that's the people who, that's like my girlfriend's so sweet. Halston, he's a sweetheart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like I try to have talented people around me, but I much rather take a chance on someone who's learning and nice than someone who's <sighs> super talented and a jerk. Absolutely, dude. That's, man. And luckily, like, on this show, that seems to be like 
an underlying rule? I know it is one that only, and I don't, I'm sorry for jumping in. Mm, I interrupted, please. but it was please. one of the first time I looked at a show and I went like, and I've never met Danny before mm-hmm. and, and I never met you, but I, we were friends online. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I know all these people and they're all sweet. I know Adam mm-hmm. for years. I know Tony for, for years. Mm-hmm. And I was just was like, I am happy for everyone. Yeah. And they're I, sweet. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Me too. It's uh, yeah. It's sort of mind blowing and so lucky. Cause yeah, you don't always get it. No. <laughs> no. There's always seems to be always somebody like making it a tiny bit weird. Yeah. And it's not the case on this one. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, it's the best. I bet you get down with uh I bet you find you get down with improvisers a lot too. I do, which yeah. is fun because I've never taken any classes mm-hmm. not trained at all i love it like but usually the best times i have in my life are like doing improvised shows with like paul f tompkins uh-huh. and things like that i love paul he always makes me feel the funniest mm-hmm. when i'm around him um but i yeah i do love it i just never got into it. i used to have a bias against it because it seemed like it took a money and i did not have mm-hmm. any mm-hmm. and it also seems extremely caucasian mm-hmm. and i was like this i remember one time i tried to go to a thing and i did it for a zip zap zop thing and i was like this isn't feel right for me <laughs> 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 yeah i mean that that sort of like beginning stuff could turn anybody off because you sort of go like what the hell is this <laughs> yeah but i love it yeah i just did a movie with um eugene Cordero uh-huh. and, and betsy sidero and mm-hmm. mary holland and uh, yeah i love working with improvisers yeah i feel like you have an improviser spirit and vibe i use like making jokes yeah and i love making things better and i love pitching jokes to, mm-hmm. that aren't necessarily for me but mm-hmm. for just changing things and having fun that's um, and I didn't even, because my first job on, on the show, I was on the Datable, it was so open to that. Uh-huh. And they would be sometimes so behind on writing that they would you would get these scripts that just say, Ron, make up a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I would literally have it written in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's awesome. And I would love it. And I got used to it. And then I went to another show and I remember going to improvise a couple of times and then they just like stopped and they were oh. like, we need you to like, and then I go, yeah, but this is, I go, I go, but look at the script. Look how it's written. I go, if I flip this, this is funnier mm-hmm. and it makes a little bit more sense. And they mm-hmm. go, yeah, but we got to call down to a thing. Oh, and I was like, man. oh no, oh, man. why did you hire me? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the thing is it's like, you have a superpower, use it or don't like to hire you and then to kneecap you with, yeah. with saying like, yeah, but the fact that you can fly, don't use it here. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> it's the word. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. You run into that a lot before? Not a ton. It seems like when I've done um, stuff that's like multi-camera, mm. it's way more set. Yes. And um, you feel, you the air almost feels pressury. Yeah. Yeah, of like, um, of a... Yeah, it's like not freedom. It's more um, prowess than it is freedom. And I I very much prefer like a freedom vibe. Of, yeah. Let's try some stuff. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And then I think genius things can happen and transcendent things can happen. But it, it almost has to be open for um, – it has to be open for, yeah, just uh, experiments and failures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I love those. The I've been thinking it's rare because it takes a um, certain level of comedic intelligence to be able to write yourself in and out of it and just know, like, hey, we'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. We'll problem solve it. Um, that's why, I, like, I did a couple of sketches with with Dan Harmon, and mm-hmm. it was like we'd show up and there was like nothing yet, and I was <laughs> like, and I was like, yes, this great. is great. Let's great. just talk it out. Yeah, we'll talk it out together. And we discussed it, and we felt as playing the Idi Amin, and we were like, we were just googling <laughs> him and looking up. Yes. At, and I was like, well, what with this, and then what if he has just has daddy issues, and that's the whole thing. <laughs> and then we just did that, and awesome. it was beautiful. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and yeah, and then the other half of it, like I did another show, um, and I would call, I would call my girlfriend at the end of every day, and I'd just be like, I don't know if I'm funny. <laughs> like, oh I, man, that's the worst. 
That feeling is the worst. Yeah. Yeah. When you feel, to me, that feeling um, creeps in. Oh man, I've asked myself that so many times. I've gotten on the phone with my husband, Dan, and been like, I think it was fine. It's that same. It's the different way of saying, I don't know if I'm funny. It's like, I think question they're mark. telling me i am yeah they're everyone seems to think it's good but i'm man, not oh, man i don't have the feeling yeah. that i use the joy i usually have when something actually is good um yeah that's the weirdest and i think that always just comes from like uh if there's a fear in the room mm. of either for time or perfection or it has to be these lines or like Somebody, somebody in the mix is worried. Yeah, and it's All like right, a lot of time. I mean, from for this one, I was on. It was seemed just to be like, like, oh, we got it. And for a lot of them, it was like they're, um, this is their show going into retirement. You know, oh, they're like, we've been it. on a couple of shows already. Mm-hmm. We don't need to improvise. Let's get home by four. Right. And I was just like, oh, okay. I mean, I loved, I loved getting home early. Sure. But I was like, can we play on one of these? Right. Can we try yeah. something new? Yeah, could we could we be open to this being hilarious? Yeah, no, maybe not. <laughs> no, yeah, but that's that's my favorite. It's like I love. I'm not necessarily great at seeing a full blank page and just going like I got something, but mm-hmm. like you give me a base mm-hmm. and I go okay. Well, this is how I I see it. I, yeah, and that's my favorite. Yeah, that's collaboration. Totally, and just being um my favorites when everyone just knows their character well enough that something could go off the rails for a minute and everyone just knows how they would react because they're just being truthful. And, no, you know, no one's trying to do jokes. Everyone's just saying what their character really would say, which is always weirdly funny because yeah. it's just true. Yes. <laughs> That's what I was talking about with Kevin Nealon, I guess, a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. It's a few minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> a ago. But that's a big thing, I think, um, as you get more experience comedically, is that you stop looking for the jokes. You stop looking for, like, how can I make this certain type of joke? Or what's the twist here? And you just start going for the truths because the truths mm-hmm. are where it really lives. That's where the jokes that don't fade away live. Totally. That's And I think that's the same with uh, with improv. My all my uh, studying of improv, uh, the roots are in um, Keith Johnstone, who's one of the sort of you know old school gurus mm-hmm. of you know the around the same uh, time as like Del Close, Keith Johnstone, whoever. Um, I know I did research on you, but he so that was part of his thing uh, is that that's when an audience a live audience really reacts and you get that weird like everyone moves forward and like a a sound comes out of everyone almost uncontrollably Mm -hmm. is when something is just true and if you just say the next thing if you just say the true thing Mm -hmm. in the moment that's what causes the biggest laughs in the audience yeah, it's been my thing that society we're not we're taught to run away from that so often. We're mm-hmm. taught to mask truth that when someone hits you with their direct truth, uh-huh. it breaks you. <laughs> totally. And forces you to laugh. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Cause we want it. Mm-hmm. Like something deep down in us in our like primal core of our soul is like, say the thing. Just like almost like we're um, you know, it's very like primate style like say say the thing (laughs) say the thing that's in my head (laughs) absolutely (laughs) where we at time wise hossy i feel like we're running long i don't want to oh perfect perfect oh great great (laughs) um so i like we always ask what because you're doing the mill great things right now but what are you what are some goals that you have uh whether personally or for your career that's something that you you're focusing on what 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 are your goals tell Mm. us let's see well just like on the super like career level i want to i want to be able to keep making this show more uh i think it's a because i think it's a giant world and a giant story that Mm -hmm. is sort of infinitely fun um and i think personally what i'm working on is um 
r- reminding myself um, that my true nature, and I think all of our true, all of all artists' true natures are fearlessness, and I want to remind myself of that over and over. <laughs> you kind of dig deeper, and unlock yourself even more. Yeah, totally. There's um. I do this this improvised one person show, and that's wowie wowie. That's when I have to really, really remind myself um, to be brave and to be fearless, and because it's you just improvise a show by yourself and you play all the characters. And I still have like old school nerves before it. I usually don't get nervous before live stuff anymore. I get kind of stoked. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one like almost makes me sick every time I do it. And uh, yeah, I have to remember giant big picture things like we're all going to die someday. All you have is tonight. Like, you know, all that kind of stuff. But that's that's a big one that I um, reminds me to be fearless. And yeah, if all we've got is this moment and and re- in this life, I'm getting to do what I want to do in this life fuck it be fearless yeah. like go toward it yeah why waste the time yeah yeah you're here you put yeah. in the work mm-hmm. you sacrifice that you what you already sacrificed yeah why would you why would you shut it down now mm. why would you be that's the big thing i see though sometimes in um careers once you get a little bit of success mm-hmm. then the money comes involved and i see it a lot in stand-up um, because I love shit talking mm-hmm. and then I would get I was like the same shit talking I was doing a couple years ago and I do it to my friends but they're on shows now and mm-hmm. then they're, they don't want to do it anymore oh, and I'm like what happened Yeah, I thought we were supposed to have fun right? and just make fun of stuff that's the job oh, what do you think that is though I think, it, I think it's money Yeah, I think when you get some money in it then it kind of freezes you up to go then you're like oh i better act professionally or maybe they won't give me any more money right what i've been leaning into is the kanye thing is it more scrutiny what i do act more stupidly yeah yeah totally yeah you have to go into it yeah yeah because it's what got you there in the first place Absolutely. so that's been i've been doing i've been getting weirder i've been yeah, doing more great. jokes about koalas great <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's your version of fearlessness. Yeah. More jokes about koalas. Yes. <laughs> at the comedy store at 11 30 p.m. After I'm following a guy talking about having sex at 12 years old. Yeah. It yep. makes me feel fearless. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> 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 you knew exactly who I was talking about. <laughs> it was. He was telling the joke. He was like, "Remember when you twelve years old and all you could do was finger a girl?" And I just go up there and I go, "I don't. That's not my twelve. I don't yeah. remember that at all. I remember trying to race home to make it home before Pokemon was over." Yeah. <laughs> That's not my 12 either. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Ghost Rider. <laughs> <laughs> I remember drawing portraits of John Bon Jovi. <laughs> 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 yeah that's a 12 i can relate to <laughs> <laughs> not this joey diaz locking people in trunks of his car <laughs> go see joey d i hope we get joey on the podcast he'd be great were you such a like a good boy yeah i was such a good girl yeah, yeah. a little nerd mm-hmm. and my mom's single mom uh mm-hmm. so you know i was like trying to look out for my sister yeah. and stuff uh, they called us Hansel and Gretel. Awesome. That was our thing at school. Awesome. So the big, yeah, just a little big nerd. Big nerd most of my life mm-hmm. till 16. Then also a nerd, but just also pothead nerd. Yeah, got it. So, still the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is still the same. And now you just throw in dad and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's still the same. Yep. Yeah, I was a nerd all the way through. Um, and then I was like a cool nerd, had a ton of friends and was like, you know, 
popular in quotes, but I was always, always a nerd. Yeah. And I'm still a nerd. And I think nerds are really fun to hang out with. And you can go deep real quick with a nerd. And I love that. Yeah. And what is a nerd but someone who is passionate about something. Yep. And, and not afraid. Not don't not having that cool. Yeah. Cool is so lame. <laughs> yeah. Cool is so lame. Because cool is apathetic. Cool is just following a trend of whatever everybody else likes. Yep. And usually it's super lame. Yep. Like how, that's not cool at all. So lame. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but people don't get that half the time. So, ooh, that's the greatest lesson of this episode so far. Just be a nerd. Be, a be nerd. yourself. And most of all, I would like to say, don't become one of those bitter nerds. That's what I don't like. I don't like that either. A lot of bitter, and I will lean it for me, a lot of bitter male nerds who then like become the very thing that they hated. They pick it on people. They're mean. Mm-hmm. They're sexist. And it's just like... You know how this felt because people made you feel bad. Yep. So why would you turn around and become a bitter nerd? Totally. Yeah, I'm not interested in a bitter nerd who's like mad at women because no one will have sex with him because he's bitter. Because, you know, the, the snake that eats its own tail. Yeah. Like, yeah, That's I like all- sweet nerd. Yeah. A fun nerd. They never get it. They're always like, oh, girl won't sleep with me because I'm not, don't got ass, not handsome. It's like, no, you're bitter and mean. No, you're no, mean. You're a bully. No one wants to be around you. Yeah. Just be a nice, sweet person that yeah. makes everyone want to be happy. Trust me, people will have sex with you. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're a bitter nerd who probably has no confidence, which equals no game. And you could be the... The biggest nerd, but if you're confident enough to go say hi to someone and ask them about themselves, you'll do all right, dude. (laughs) Absolutely. Perfect. And I love what you said. You didn't say just go up and talk to them. Ask them about themselves. Yeah. Show some interest. Yeah. Don't don't just because you go over there. You just like basically a lot of times you just like, hey. I want some sex. <laughs> it's like, yeah. That's easy to turn down. Yeah. Nobody nobody wants to say yes to that. <laughs> oh, really? You want some? Great. <laughs> Let's leave this place we're in. Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes me feel special. Like it came uh, straight for me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you fun time. What's the writing process like? On can I ask you that? Yeah. What? Because I imagine it's a little different. So so much imp- improvising and stuff. What's it like? Um, it's you know we always get the stuff to you as written because mm-hmm. the scripts are are really good, and um, then it just sort of gets decided later if any of the stuff we improvised gets used or not. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. But um, we we all kind of would come together and then um, different people would write different episodes per week. Mm. So each week we would have a new version of every episode just to get inches down the road a little bit. Absolutely. Um, And even if, you know, the version of episode four had nothing that carried over into the next week, it's like a stab at, Maybe some of this stuff or mm-hmm. maybe some of this stuff. And these scenes can be moved mm-hmm. around, might end up in a different episode. Yeah, yeah, totally. And you just keep on inching forward until, um, you know, one is done, then two is done, then three is done, then four is done. But yeah, kind of everybody is, uh, everybody's taking stabs the whole time separately and mm-hmm. then all coming together to oh, discuss stuff. Like a little Milton pot. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, get a lot of different viewpoints. That mm-hmm, way. For sure. That's smart. Yeah, there were a lot of people in the room too that had uh, interesting religious backgrounds. Like uh, one of the dudes that was in the room for a big chunk of time, Jared Hess, like used to be a Mormon. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys had a uh, a dad who was the music guy for um, not Jimmy Swaggart, but one of those dudes one of those main dudes. So he grew up in a, actually in a mega church and um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to hear different people's takes on growing up within that. And we all kind of did in some way, different ways, but what I find interesting about this show that I think is relatable is like, cause it, yeah, you don't necessarily have to have gone to a mega church to really kind of 
see the overarching themes of this, which is a lot of like hypocrisy mm -hmm. of how people tell you to live their life in mm -hmm. regard to how they live their life. Sure. And a lot of people uh, just taking advantage of people with hope and people who it needs in telling them like, we can provide your salvation with, with your tidings and your money. And I think that's um, a great message mm -hmm. to get out there. And when it seemed like it would be difficult to, to have like networks get behind, but it seems like you guys are not even really like subtle. It's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's right there. Yeah. I think, I think hopefully the thing that makes the show fun is that it's uh the show is not about uh, that as much as it's about, oh, here's this flawed family who happens to be in this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wonder if it would get super boring super fast if, if the focus was, um, you know, all about the church and all yeah. about hypocrisy. Um, it's like these these colorful people against the backdrop of it, you know? Mm, yeah, that is my, yeah. Cause that's, I've seen other shows where they're not necessarily dealing with that, but just sometimes some network shows will drive directly into religion. Cause they're like, this is a quick way to get market to mm -hmm. a group of people who are loyal viewers. Sure. And, but it, they never seem to work out mm -hmm. because they're not really actual funny or good stories. Right. They're just trying to be like, here's religion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's like, well, I mean, really, who are we to say that anything anyone believes is right or wrong? That I don't think that's really our job or our intent. It's just, hey, look at these people. They happen to be in this world, <laughs> which hopefully you'll find funny and interesting. Well, I do. Yeah. From one episode, Halston's Watch 2, he's still in. <laughs> 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 the time to land, Halston. Okay, let's land the plane. Okay, let's land it. How we normally land is by asking for a piece of advice for a thing maybe you've been thinking on, focusing on, struggling with. Just something that you can share with our getting better community to help us get better. I know it's vague. Everyone nails it. Great. Let's see. I think... Everyone, I think everyone goes through chunks of time where you feel like lost or oh, what am I doing or how, how do I do this? Or, you know, whether it's you're trying to, you're trying to become an actor, you're trying to become a stand up or you're trying to, whatever you're trying to do, you're trying to uh, get a relationship or you're trying to. And I think, I think what I think right now today is that if you can just keep keep going toward um keep going toward the love and what makes you feel joyful whether that's performing live every week or um going for hikes or whatever it is just keep doing that stuff and and know that the the frequency of joy you feel is where it's at mm. that things will work out if you just keep going toward that feeling mm. of lightness it's like a, a a happiness metal detector that you got totally. going. Totally, it shouldn't let you know if you're on your path or not. If you're finding that joy, if you're feeling that, yeah, joy. yeah, I love that. That's great advice. Thank you okay, for sharing yeah. that. Cool. I love it because I love the opposite of that. Because I see so many people. I ran into some some form some not former friends, but friends I know from a long time mm -hmm. still doing stand up and and you know, I'm doing okay and, mm -hmm. and then they're not doing as well. And you can kind of see like a bitterness mm -hmm. in it and, and and some of it they've even like gone through divorces or having trouble with, you know, with the relationship with their kids. And part of me just wants to be like, look it doesn't seem like you're getting joy from this. Mm -hmm. Get out. Yeah. If you're not. Totally. If it's not making you happy every step of the way, mm -hmm. not just when you get money, not yeah. just when you get on a TV show, because there's always a next day. There's always another opportunity. There's always a no. There's always another mountain to climb. Yes. So if you're not <laughs> joyful about it every day, about that, that. Just get for me getting on stage, holding that microphone mm -hmm. for you being up there, your one woman show by yourself mm -hmm. or writing or whatever it would be. If you don't feel that joy from that actual activity, from the work of it, yeah. then you're probably not in the right field for you. Totally. I couldn't agree more with that. 
Yay! Yeah. yeah, those moments should be like little weightless escapes where you go off into space and you're like, oh yeah, this is the this is the real me. This is my real consciousness. And like, yeah, where you forget all the troubles. Yeah. And if it doesn't feel like that. Mm. Yeah, you might want to move along. And we know, you know, it's not like sometimes I'm going to the comedy store at night and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go sit in traffic. I don't mm -hmm. want to do this. Or I'm worried how my set goes. But like when I'm the moment I'm actually on that stage and they call in my name, it's like that's where I feel at home. That's where I'm happy. Yeah. And I feel like that's why I know, like you said, if, if they didn't pay me a dime, I yep. would still go. Usually they don't because I forget to get my checks <laughs> for, <laughs> for months at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go in six months and I get a bunch of checks and I buy weed with it. A big it's, stack. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times I, my bank won't take them because they're too old. <laughs> and you have to get a reissue? Yeah. <laughs> or I just go home and I deposit electronically because they don't, the, the phone, my phone don't care. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. That's awesome. <laughs> You're awesome. Thanks for uh, having me. Thank you for coming. And I want to say, um, I'm glad that we're internet friends. I'm glad that you came here because just being around you, um, I only know you a little bit, but oh, I love your spirit. I love um, just talking to you. Makes me feel good. Thanks, you dude. Intelligent and, and really funny. And I love the work that you're doing. Uh, I love it before I met you and I lo love it more now. And so I just think that... Um, we're lucky and I'm happy to have people like you who are out there doing nerdy, intelligent, uh, fun work. And I, I want to make sure I tell you that I appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate you. I'm so happy to be here. Yay. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out our last episode right over here. Bam. Or perhaps a video picked by our overlords at YouTube. Boop. And don't forget to subscribe. Hit it up! Hit it up! Press the button. Press it!